that every Friday morning between 9 and 10, we used to meet in the auditorium and there was a nice clinical meeting. And after the meeting, very often, I used to give a small snippet on the history of medicine. Now that I've finished revising the fourth edition, or almost finished revising the fourth edition of my critical care book, and have time on my hands, I thought at least we can't have the clinical meeting, but perhaps I could give you a snippet almost every Friday. This is by and large directed to the staff, students, my registrars, my senior nurses, and the second in commands who used to attend these meetings. Uh, I really miss all of y'all because I've been housebound for such a long time. So I really miss y'all. So this is one way of getting across to you. The coronavirus and pandemic is raging here. I want therefore to give you a snippet on the pandemic influenza which raged between 1918 and 1919. After the Black Death, it was the greatest endemic to hit the world. It's often called the Spanish flu. But believe me, that's a misnomer. It didn't really start in Spain, as the name implies. But then you give a dog a bad name and hang it. Actually, no one knows for sure where it started. Cases were reported almost simultaneously in Europe, France, Britain, also in America, and funnily enough, also in Asia, including China. As usual, the Chinese blame the Americans, and the Americans blame the Chinese history repeating itself. But frankly, nobody is sure about it. I'll tell you how it went about. The first case report, remarkably enough, was from America. It was from a military camp in America. I can't remember the name. A soldier. But mind you, this is a report, the first report. But that does not mean that there were no other cases around. There might have been other cases around which have not been reported, which were not reported at that time. Now in 1918, America joined the Allied Front against Germany and it had mustered troops and it sent about 200,000 troops, first in spring, then in summer. So they say that initially when these soldiers, young soldiers, were carrying the virus, they brought it with them to Europe. God alone knows where it was already there in Europe. And they straight went to the fight. Now it was a remarkable sort of a war that was fought. The most absurd and the stupid war in the annals of history. You know what they used to do? The Allies would build trenches and the soldiers were inside and the Germans would build trenches about 300, 400 meters away, and they were in trenches. And one group would jump out and try and take opposite trench. And they were often mowed down and they died. The generals were stupid, and it was, as I said, the most stupidest war that was ever fought. But remember, in those conditions, where all those soldiers were crowded into trenches with filthy conditions and absolutely no hygiene whatsoever, you can imagine how easily it could spread amongst the soldiers. So that's one important thing to remember. But I mustn't forget to tell you why I said that it did not originate in Spain. You see, Spain was the only neutral country in the First World War. And why was it a neutral country? Because it had just gone through an awful, awful civil war 
between the nationalists led by Francisco Franco, a dreadful dictator, and the Republicans. Francisco Franco, with the heading the nationalists, defeated the Republicans to some extent with the help of Germany. For some reason or the other, Germany sided with Francisco Franco. So they sent bombers to bomb the Republican sites. And one of the sites, just as an aside, that was bombed to smithereens was a small place in Guernica. It was neither a village nor a city, perhaps something between a village and or a city. It bombed it to smithereens with all its people. And it caused a lot of outrage into Europe and caused the great Spanish painter, Pablo Picasso, to paint his very famous canvas, Time Guernica. So what happened was Spain was exhausted. It had had a civil war which had ended in 38. So they opted out, fortunately, and did not come in. However, it was badly hit by the flu. And this was reported widely in the papers in Spain. But the flu pandemic outside in Europe was suppressed by the press because of censorship. They didn't want everyone to know because it would hurt the morale of the army and of the civilian forces if it were to come out. So it was rampant in Spain and it was broadcasted in Spain and therefore they said that it originated in Spain because the other countries kept quiet at that point in time. So that's one important point to remember. Now let me tell you about the spread. It is amazing that within a matter of a few months, this pandemic spread to almost all corners of the world. And like the coronavirus, it respected no one. For example, King Alfonso of Spain was struck down with this influenza virus. For example, also in 1919, when Woodrow Wilson was signing the Versailles Treaty, he was ill with this influenza. Had he not, perhaps he would not have made such a dreadful treaty. For I don't know whether you know, the Treaty of Versailles was a prelude to the Second World War. So it spread like fire. Now, you should know what were the symptoms of this. Earlier on, when it first started in spring, it was like an ordinary flu. And most people recovered in a short period of time. But as time went on, by the summer of 1918, there was a change in the sort of symptoms patients manifested. And it became severe. And the second peak that arose in 1918, in the autumn of 1918, decimated people. I must tell you how many people were infected in this pandemic. You won't believe it. 500 million people were infected in that pandemic, which means one third of the global population. You multiply that by three and you'll know what the global population was at that time. And 50 million, on a conservative estimate, were killed or died. The current estimate is perhaps more than 50, perhaps 80 or even 100 million perished as a result of this pandemic. When the symptoms were really bad, it has been recorded that patients would die within 24 hours of the onset of symptoms. They would die of pulmonary edema. The lungs would be filled with water. So the symptoms were ghastly and in some cases it was dreadful. And the most dreadful thing about it, which is rather different from what we see today in the, the, the coronavirus, is that the most healthy individuals were brought down, were stricken down. Young lads between 17 and 30 and adults between 20 and 40, 30 and 40, were the most affected, as also the very elderly and the very young below five. 
But what happened was that the very, very you can't say, I mean, you would say that, well, it was because of the soldiers mixing with each other, in, with each other under bad hygiene. That is why they infected each other. They were young. And that is why it was between such a small, young age. But no, when it spread to the civilian population, even here, the killing was basically of young, healthy individuals. And that was a tragedy of the whole city. You would want to know what it was due to. I'm sure, you med as medical doctors, you know that it was influenza. It was influenza A, and it was influenza H1N1. Of course, at that point in time, they didn't know what it was and what it was due to. Because viruses had not been discovered by that. I think, I'm not sure whether it was in the 1930s that viruses were first seen through different forms of microscopes. So it was not understood as to what was happening, but it was really a bad H1N1 pandemic. And when did they find that out? They found that out sometime in 2000. You won't believe it. It is believed that it was an H1N1 strain and that it had mutated and it had incorporated avian genes within it, three avian genes, which was responsible for this dreadful mutation. So that's how the pandemic raged. There are certain important points worth knowing besides the fact that the younger people were most affected and therefore it brought havoc to the economy of all countries in the world and all countries were in a state of great, great depression both economically, both financially and both mentally. Is there any other difference? Yes, there is one important change but one important similarity, there was no drug that could act on the virus then and there is no drug, as you know, which acts on the coronavirus now. But there was one thing which the doctors did which helped, helped to kill people rather than cure them. In those days, they thought that aspirin was a panacea for many things. And therefore, the medical fraternity advised that the drug to give in these individuals was aspirin. And they gave as much as 30 grams of aspirin as a cure for this. And actually, the maximum dose that you should give is just 4 grams. Now, everyone knows today that in aspirin poisoning, what you get is hyperventilation and you get pulmonary edema. So it's quite possible that some of the deaths, perhaps 2, 3, 4 percent of the deaths in young people might have been related to the aspirin, to the huge poisonous doses of aspirin that they consume. Even if it's two, three, four percent, it would amount to a number of million people. So this is how it was. So you had one peak in summer, and you have a second peak in autumn, sometime in August, and towards the end of 18 and the beginning of 19, by the spring or summer of 1919, the pandemic went away, leaving death and destruction behind its trail. I think it, you must remember that no epidemic and no pandemic can last forever. Even if you did nothing, it would kill lots of people if you did nothing, of course. So that either people who have died from it or people who had infected and recovered from it. And those who had been infected and recovered, they would develop an immune response and therefore the epidemic then would die. So this is how it is. Now, do you think the coronavirus and the virus, H1N1 virus, responsible for the pandemic of influenza have the same virulence? 
I can't help feeling that the pandemic of 1819 was worse than the coronavirus, though it can't be sure how things are going to shape in the future. But I doubt <coughs> at present whether the coronavirus is going to kill, kill 80 million to 100 million people within the next six to seven months. I think that's about all I want to tell you. Uh, there were other H1N1 epidemics too. I remember when I was in London in 1958 studying, I was struck down by a very bad flu at that time. I couldn't get out of bed for eight days. At that time, the H1N1 epidemic was raging. Endemic or pandemic was raging. There were other pandemics since then. There were recent pandemics of H1N1, of SARS, as you well know. So it's not that there have been no recent pandemics. They have been there, but nothing like the present pandemic produced by the COVID-19 that we see today, which has brought such a lot of debt to so many people and which has brought a crushing blow to the economy of almost all countries in the world, particularly poor developing countries. I think that will be all I want to tell you. Hopefully, next Friday, I might give you another sneak.